Hi there, I'm Katie Bain, the director of Billboard Dance, and I'm here with a trio of experts to talk about supercharging live stream events for DJs. Welcome guys, please go ahead and introduce yourselves. Who wants to start? Go for it, Ed. Uh, my name is Ed Hill, I am the VP of Beatport Media Group, um, and we have been pushing live streaming for the last kind of two years um, as a kind of new initiative to, to reach more people. Amazing. Uh, my name is Sherry Bryant. I am president of Sansar, which is a immersive 3D live events platform um, serving DJs and um, other musicians. Hey guys, uh, my name is Emil Anishman. I uh, work for a platform called Twitch. It is a live stream platform for video games that has recently emerged into both sports and music and has become a big hub for uh, a lot of DJs in uh, during the pandemic. All right. Thank you all. And you know, to start, obviously the pandemic has changed everything for the music industry and particularly for the dance scene, which is so based on live events. And so, you know, to start, I want to ask you guys, how was the electronic music community primed for the transition to live streaming? Like, what made it possible to, to do what felt like a pretty quick pivot? And Neil's probably the, the best person to answer this, but the short answer is, you know, EDM and DJs um, and gaming have a hand, been hand in hand for years. And um, they follow each other, they influence each other. And so when this happened, there was an immediate um, attraction um, to the virtual space. And, and Neil, I'll, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, I think culturally, there's always been uh, a lot of uh, adjacency between both music and, and gaming for a while. I mean, we can date this all the way back to digitally imported.com to stick am to Ustream. Um, this is like decades back of in terms of online content and in the gaming community, several gaming events, um, have highlighted DJs at the end as like part of like their after party. Um, and culturally, you know, people who love video games also love music. And so there's always been this crossover that's been available. Um, and I think, uh, this was the one silver lining of the pandemic in that, you know, it gave a lot of people an opportunity and a platform to kind of be able to showcase not only their music, but also kind of express themselves in a way that they may have not been able to do so before um, through live streaming. Sure. Sure. Got it. Um, and, and, and maybe sort of you already answered this, but to what extent was, was this quick pivot a function of the electronic scene just being so innately tech forward? I think, yeah. I think so I, I think the other thing is that, the DJ culture, they're all used to playing so often, right? And they, it's not like a band who goes on a tour and then stops and stuff. DJs are used to playing in front of people the whole time. And so they needed that connection with their fans somehow, because, you know, without going out three, four times a week and DJing, you know, they kind of lost that. And it was obviously, you know, for a band or whatever, it's a bit harder to get everyone together. But for a DJ, you just need a camera, two CDJs and, and whatever, and you can just start going and you can instantly start communicating with your fans. And I think that's why they were very fast to adopt. Yeah, I mean, it felt like it was within a matter of two or three days, these live streams started. Yeah. Uh, and, and so what you're saying is like, they, they were already there, like they already had the technology to do it. Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, once you see some people doing it and getting the, the you know, everyone talks to each other and how, what's the best way of doing it. You know, when we did Reconnect, it was a 36 hour broadcast live from all around the world. And a lot of that was kind of, you know, how do we do this? Because it was in the middle of the pandemic. I mean, nothing was open. So no one could even go out to the store and buy anything. So we were having to figure out how to just stream high, high quality audio off your phone to, a, to, a, um, to, to a, a stream on Facebook and Twitch and YouTube and stuff. So once we kind of, everybody started figuring this out, it became quite quick and everyone's like, you know, DJs are producers, they're, they're normally fairly technically savvy and it was just like, right, this is how we're gonna do it. And, you know, it kind of snowballed from there. Yeah, and there were early adopters already. So pre-pandemic, people were already doing this. Like we had been working with Blaster Jacks and Monster Cat and 
um, and Neil, you too, Monster Cat was already huge on Twitch. And so there was some knowledge of it already and people doing early innovation. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, obviously a lot more people uh, got on the bandwagon. Mm. Yeah, there was, a, there, there was also a lot of information sharing that happened very early on amongst DJs in terms of how to configure a stream and how to get up and going and being able to kind of utilize your existing equipment to kind of, you know, just get up and going and then creating a turnkey solution for a lot of, a lot of DJs and not having to go out and buy additional equipment. So um, a lot of it, <clears throat> I think was uh, to, to, to add in Sherry's point, you know, uh, previous, previous early adopters, but there's also a lot of information that was being shared amongst the community where it was like, Hey, you know, you may not know what the heck this Twitch thing is. Or you may not know what the heck OBS is, but let me show you how easy it is to configure it with your existing equipment. And, I think that gave a lot of people a quick solution to kind of get up and going. Um, and, and, and it really, I think, served the need for, for, for the broad community. I think it was also kind of like perfect timing for Twitch as they were kind of ramping into music and then this happened. And then, you know, some of the numbers that you can get or generate on Twitch and everyone's like, wow, look what that artist is doing. How do I get that? And the two kind of just merged at exactly the right point. And, you know, I think with it, Without Twitch and uh, their support in that, I think the, the single stream DJ kind of live stream may, may not have taken off the, in the same trajectory that it did, certainly through the pandemic. So I think it was like a, it was a sort of meeting of two, two things at exactly the right time. Sure. Yeah, and Neil, you mentioned sort of the, the needs of the community and obviously people want to connect. They want to see each other. We miss each other. We want to hear music. What are the needs for artists and brands beyond that? It's a good question. Um, I would say that uh, a, a big a big desire of, of the community, I think it kind of goes both ways, right? For the viewers, it's uh, a replacement of, of live events and, and being able to feel kind of like you're going out. Um, and I think uh, one of the cool things early on of the pandemic was artists and DJs were, were doing these like little mini festivals kind of pop up. And this is at a time where, you know, I think we, we, we had... We, we hoped to have the foresight that the pandemic was going to be only a short-term thing. And so uh, we saw a lot of these like little mini festivals popping up. We saw a few record labels put together these like weekly content formats where it's like, hey, club quarantine, you, know, you can tune in every Friday night and catch Diplo or, or, or so-and-so on, on a live stream. And I think uh, that served a, a big need for the, at least from the, for, for the community in, in aggregate. But I think over time that started to, become more refined for, for brands as well, because those advertising dollars that they're spending, you know, at live events, live festivals, no longer serve the purpose. So I think a lot of that starts to become uh, reallocated towards live streams and figuring out how they can activate um, with individual DJs. Uh, not doing a good job of explaining that, but you know, it's kind of a, kind of a broad question uh, and I'll, I'll kick it to Sherry and Ed as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, and it gets back to what Ed said in the very beginning, like, it's it's all about the fans, and it's all about the connection, and when you do have something like this happen to an entire planet, how do you connect with people, and that obviously becomes a virtual experience, and um, that, that, that was the main thrust, but I also think that now it's turned into a more... Um, permanent viewpoint on on revenues and how how do artists make money how do they make money outside of regular IRL touring and how do they reach a more global audience you know if you're going to do a show in Vegas or if you're just doing something down the street how do you then uh, make that available uh, to the rest of the world so I think there's a few different things going on and I know Kitty you, you want to talk a bunch more about revenue but that's an exciting part of this beyond like having a different and potentially deeper experience at a show. Um, it's also adding a layer, not taking away, but adding a layer on top of the revenues that artists are already making. Definitely. And Ed, is there anything you want to add there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, speaking about brands specifically, you know, I think it's a real opportunity for them to kind of get on board with streaming. You know, live streaming has been around for years and years and it's always been, you know, a brand will come in and want to do uh, an experiential piece in a, in a festival and then that'll be it. But actually the amount of views and eyeballs and impressions that you can generate 
forest stream is is pretty incredible and it's probably the best ROI you can you can find anywhere uh, and so it's now just you know I think we all just need to think about how to take it up a level so that it's not just you know you're not just sponsoring something it's actually you know you're integrated with the stream with the artist with the community and and just kind of make it more kind of as a sort of holistic approach to to your marketing strategy and i think a lot of brands are kind of looking into that now um so it's you know, it's beneficial i think yeah. just to add, add on to that as well sorry sure um yeah. you know the 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 live stream community and i say that in aggregate in terms of just like platforms uh historically especially for for things that were non-endemic to gaming uh I think the original format was just to be a title sponsor, right? To come in and just take over an entire live stream and say, Hey, this is sponsored by so-and-so brand. Um, and uh, brands like Beatport have actually been really pushing the envelope and changing what that format looks like and doing a whole new type of takeover in terms of what does it mean for a brand to support an ND like Beatport and what does that experience look like? And I do just to, to, to back up Ed's point, there's several different ways you can kind of back up and, and even, uh, drive conversion towards a, a particular company or sponsor or brand uh, in terms of them supporting your live stream. So I think that there's tons of opportunities. Uh, the gaming community has proven that to be quite fruitful. Um, you can go on to a live stream platform right now and watch someone who is doing a sponsored gaming stream, I would say almost once every day at this point in terms of cadence. So we're starting to see a lot more of that happening in the music community. And I do look forward to seeing the innovative ways that we can kind of of activated people. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add, Forbes just did an article actually on how the the, the live streaming uh, advertising business is going to explode and they're already predicting two billion for this year and you know catastrophic rise beyond that and we've definitely seen it as, as live streaming platforms and <clears throat> let's see we just did a show with Absolute um, where they sponsored it and we created uh, floating giant absolute bottles that people could get into and ride around on the mm -hmm. dance floor. <laughs> so the thing about virtual is you could do anything. The, the, any idea that you want to do in terms of finding a way besides a billboard, you know, to, to look at a brand and to interact with a brand. We did the same with Pioneer DJ. We did a, we recreated a deck, and people I think on average press buttons 70 times on it so brands are gonna soon see that that the um the ability for to have fans interact in really different ways is just now starting super exciting mm -hmm. yeah i'm and i'm glad you brought up the brand aspect because i mean we i want to talk about money and sort of profitability and sort of how the profitability is has changed in the last it's been what 11 months like, were these live streams profitable in the beginning? And then how has that evolved in the last year since we've been in quarantine? I mean, That's a great question. Yeah, I'll, I'll let think, it go first. I think, um, you know, sponsoring streams has always kind of been around. But as we said, the kind of new initiatives and the new kind of ways to, to drive these partnerships and streams it has it been evolving. And it's kind of as the brand's don't have their experiential and they don't have the way to come into the festival they do need to pivot and they do need to look at other ways of doing it and so <laughs> as time goes on um certainly in the pandemic we're finding more and more brands are kind of coming over and and ones that wouldn't necessarily have you know put so much sort of effort and, and um sort of optics into live streaming and they're all kind of coming over and that's a really big part of where the the money will come from for for live streams and for artists um and i think that's just going to keep 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 rolling for sure and and how quickly did that transition happen where brands saw this as an opportunity to sort of get into this space yeah it, i don't know from my perspective um i mean relatively quickly i mean most of most of these brands kind of knew that this live streaming was a thing right but they had to kind of different ways that they could t tap into different marketing initiatives. And now that those are gone, I think it took a while for people to think, because I think what happened was a lot of people were like, well, we'll wait till Q4. I know, okay, we'll wait till Q2, we'll wait till Q4, you know, and now it's like, okay, you know, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to do something. Um, and I think that's what we're kind of experiencing now. Everyone's kind of, um, um, which is, we're rightly kind of looking at this as a, a really big opportunity, yeah. but it does shift. But it does shift the whole landscape and who's in charge and who's 
which agencies are involved and which kind of marketing pocket, you know, it, all, it, it, it shifts and that the, the, for big companies that can take a while. Yeah, I was just going to add, I come from the film industry where I saw um, how long it took the film industry in general and, and its advertisers to move from traditional to digital. So mm. seeing this, I mean, it's like lightning fast. Mm. And, and that's really because of the pandemic, of course. But I think that if you look at it compared to, to past events and how people have moved over to new technologies, it's damn fast, mm. which, is, which makes it exciting. Yeah, and I think the uh, the the other part is you know a lot of this is kind of pertaining to brands individually, right? We're not even talking about individual DJs and artists and, and promoters that are even appearing on live streams, which I think is like a whole other world. Um, in short, uh, you know, live streaming in, in general has created a brand new like subculture of uh, how people interact with each other, and Twitch, I would say, is heavily recognition driven you know uh people have a strong desire to to want to be recognized and and be called out and as a matter of fact we build several features within the platform to help you know people who contribute or 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 take any type of action and within the stream to be able to be recognized and called out for it and it's cool because you're basically having something that feels tangible but it's more based off of an experience so you think about like if sherry was to follow me or if i was to tip at three bucks because I think that he's got a sick set going on right now. Like these are all things that are all contributing and, and supporting each other. And they are things that, you know, we can basically return the favor by acknowledging and calling them out. And that means a lot to people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm bright. I'm glad you brought that up in terms of, you know, smaller artists that are getting $3 here, $3 there. Mm-hmm. Like, how big of a brand do you have to be? you have to be you know like an insomniac or diplo to make real money and what is happening to the artists that would have been on you know the second from bottom line for the ultra lineup in terms of of making money through live streams right now i think uh uh dj spider and dj jazzy jeff did a podcast recently where jazzy jeff was talking about this and jazzy jeff said something along the lines of you know you're uh your, your club promoter and club owner, you know, they're watching your replacement right now on a live stream. So if you're not doing anything, you're not keeping yourself active and, 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 you know, showcasing your efforts, like they're looking for your replacement and they're looking for them on Twitch. So, you know, th- this is a time for, for everyone to kind of not only to continue what they're doing to, to continue their efforts, but to continue to showcase who they are. And I think uh, culturally, there's a lot of new DJs that are kind of popping up or maybe DJs that people haven't heard of before. And thanks to live streaming, are able to be able to connect with them and they're making, they're making great money. Some of them are making more money live streaming than they are from, from their individual gigs. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is really shifting how I think uh, some DJs have performed traditionally in the past. And of course, nothing will beat the experience of being live in front of a crowd and being able to see how your music sways the the audience live. Um, but I do think that from a physics standpoint, given the circumstances we're at right now, this is totally shifting how people not only monetize themselves and their content, but also giving them a, a new livelihood as well. Um, mm-hmm. So and on top of that, there are people that don't go to clubs. There are people that don't go to festivals that, you know, for whatever reason, just don't want to. And now they're able to connect with a whole new demographic, a whole new audience. So I think in terms of access, it's also changed that as well. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Ed, what do you want to say? So, what, so one of the artists we actually booked for our show with Absolute was uh, an artist called uh, DJ Ray Ray, who's a big Twitch DJ. And we, I, I found her on Twitch, saw her numbers, saw how good she was. And, you know, we, we, she got that booking purely because I found her on, on Twitch. Um, so if, uh, from that standpoint... Um, I think, as, as Nell said, it's, it's, it's a great sh- window for people to come in and, and find up-and-coming talent. Um, but also, I think, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the smaller artists that are putting in the effort and putting in the time. You don't have to be a Diplo to be, to be on here. And actually, the, the, you know, the main artists probably aren't on it as much as the kind of small underground ones who are kind of coming up. Um, and, yeah, so I don't think it's about how big you are. Um, when you're kind of running donations and tips and all that kind sure. of stuff. Sure, I mean, that's a good point. Like, you can sort of grind a little bit more as a smaller artist because you aren't as visible and people aren't really tracking every show you play. 
Yeah. Too. Yeah. No, I was just going to say uh, uh, to your point and, and everyone else is that this medium democratized everything and everyone. Um, and it even weights in my mind more towards smaller artists because some smaller artists could never afford to be on the road or be, be doing, whereas, you know, Hey, you're in your house, you're in your living room, whatever it is. Um, and you can get to a group of fans. You can get onto Twitch. You can appeal to someone like Ed or be in Sansar. And um, it's, it's all your own effort because these platforms are available um, with revenue um, levers for you and you just got to get out there and do it. Um, you know, we have probably, I don't know, three to five uh, DJ events a day from, you know, no, no one you might have heard of. And it's a, it's a place for discovery. Same with Twitch. Those numbers are, you know, in the like hundreds of thousands probably of just people getting on. But that's what you do. You have to get on and build your brand. And, you know, we can look to the old YouTube days too. Like what was YouTube way back when? And look what happened to the people that got on. I mean, they became major influencers. They're making millions of dollars. You know, DJs should look at um, the various platforms in that way. Pick the one that, that matches their brand or is easy for them and just, get out there and do the hard work and, and grow your fans. And um, I don't know, it's, it's, um, it's just, it's just a playground right now and everyone should be playing in it. That's a really good point. Thank you. And, and do you think it's fair to say that once festivals and clubs open back up, promoters are going to look at numbers from streaming and we're going to see sort of a generation or, you know, a group of sort of new stars that establish establish themselves in this way. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's only natural, isn't it? It's like, you know, that's the kind of stuff you're, you're looking for. Um, Why wow, this, this person's doing this amount of views on their streams, you know, and then you could probably, you know, get into the data of, you know, well, where are they popular? Well, the, you know, the, this country here or this city here, they've got thousands of people that are actually watching them from this city. Okay, well, we're going to put them in the city. Um, and that's all the kind of data stuff that we, we can get into and, and, and should start kind of sharing. And, it becomes like a really, a really good sort of base for 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 bookings and for for um, for festivals and, and for events to kind of glean who they should be who they should be looking to. Yeah, that's fascinating. Neil, Sherry, is there anything you want to add there? No. I think, well, uh, I, I think I've got really. Um, you know, Ed, you mentioned the, the Beatport Reconnect event, which happened pretty early on, if I remember correctly. I know that there were. There was more than one, but what were the first live stream events that you guys saw where you, you know, it, 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 you felt that the format had leveled up and you were like, whoa, this is what this format is capable of. I mean, for me, it, it was, uh, you know, it, it obviously it was a B poor thing, but I think the reconnect thing was like, I think for me, that was when, um, we kind of realized shit this is this is massive you know um and this is gonna this is gonna go far the amount of press the amount of money we raised um the amount of interest you know i hadn't really seen anything i've been <clears throat> working in live streaming for like 10 years and i hadn't seen anything like that before um uh, and off the back of it there was so many labels and artists all kind of just starting to go and go and then there was live streams popping up every kind of you know few days um and then defected started doing a really good series defected did, did an awesome job um it, on their london series i think they were you know doing some really standout stuff uh, obviously they got amazing people that were working there and really good talent and um they had a cause for it as well you know to sort of to save light off that was the other thing about a lot of the streams it was all kind of for it was all four things. It was all, you know, at the beginning, it was just like, well, we're raising money for this, we're raising money for that, we're raising, you know, and it was all kind of, it kind of galvanized everyone. And that was a really nice part of it. Um, and I think that's something that we, you know, should try and continue um, as, as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, I've been <clears throat> impressed across the board <clears throat> at so many things, honestly, and how quickly they popped up. For me, seeing really big organizations and festivals do these things is pretty impressive. Um, for us on Sansar last July, 
Um, we had um, the Shangri-La Lost Horizon Festival with over 70 artists. I mean, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. and, yeah. <laughs> Ed and I were uh, awake for 24 hours there. Um, we worked with people. It was great, right, Ed? And um, the, the amount of um, interaction and, and the people watching on stream and wondering, like, what the heck is this? Because that was kind of, you know, newer. But just the ability um, to have a long um, weekend long festival and have so many different kinds of artists in come in and have different fans popping in and out and having it be so global. I think it was over 1200 yeah. cities yeah, was, or something like that. Yeah, it was an amazing lineup as well, you know, with Carl and Peggy Goo and everything. And I think, um, you know, that was another kind of turning moment because it was, you're quite used to seeing DJ sets and, you know, they're kind of no, normal format. And then suddenly you've got like turtles and, people with like lamps on their heads and stuff <laughs> around on all these avatars and everyone's just like, well, what is that? Uh, and that was a really cool kind of turning point um, for us as well that, you know, um, you know, any, anything's possible. And the Sands Art stuff for Philosophizing was, was, was really amazing. Cool. Anil, anything you want to add there? Yeah, you know, I, 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 it's funny. When you asked the question, I was thinking about like, what was that one particular event that like really strike the match for me and to be honest like i can't really necessarily pinpoint one particular event i think it was like a culmination of everything that was kind of happening at that time um to ed's point you know a lot of the initial live streams that were um created at those times a lot of more for uh relief funds whether it been for for covid whether it been for uh artists or venues and and and, and whatnot so um, I can't necessarily pinpoint to one, but I do remember like towards the end of March, beginning of April, you know, we start to see a, a huge wave of these kind of charity live streams that were happening. And I think that really paved the, 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 the road for uh, several other entities, smaller ones at that, um, to kind of come in and really kind of set the norm of like, hey, this is something that uh, we initially thought was just going to be a, a proof of concept and it really proved to be fruitful and engaging for people. Um, and so I think to me, rather than looking at a particular event, I think it was really more just in terms of timing. I think that April, May timeline was really when things start to, to kind of hit this uh, new momentum. And we start to really see this grow at an exponential rate month over month. Yeah, and Neil, you're being modest because I mean, Twitch is the best platform for charities there's so much money is raised every year on twitch it's incredible that mm. people really care about it and the music industry continue that as well what when all of these you know concerts and live streams started popping up so much money um went into it and, it, and it's you know because of the communities on twitch that that all that money was raised it's really amazing yeah and, and also the way that you you know, it's not just putting a link up and being like, right, you know, you can donate there. It's, you know, leaderboards and bots. It's just like the way you can donate and with the maybe almost like gamifying it and stuff was yeah. you know, super cool. And it was just a completely different like aspect. It's something that I didn't really realize was possible until we started. And then, yeah, the, the amount of functionality you can have to, to, to raise money makes a massive difference to, to, to how people do it. Like you guys just gave me the perfect segue because I did want to talk about Twitch specifically and you know how Twitch has become such a leader in this moment in this space like why was why was your platform sort of so primed to be able to you know to do this it's a great question um, I think that Twitch as a platform from a from a product standpoint has been uh, something that has been iterated and refined for almost a decade at this point, actually a little over a decade in terms of technology. And, uh, you know, initially this was more geared for uh, our, our, our gaming audience, our gaming fans. And we really worked hard with our video teams and engineering teams to basically provide a consistent experience across the world. Um, and that wasn't always the case. And I think between that and what we did with community, Twitch has always been a very community first platform. Um, I came from the gaming community prior to joining Twitch. And I knew about Twitch just because of how they contributed back to gaming and how they were able to support not only individual pro gamers, but also tournaments and leagues and whatnot. And so we were able to kind of replicate that same format in the music community. We hired a lot of amazing, talented people from the music community. Uh, I can name Athena, Toy, and a handful of other 
folks, Valerie included, who Katie, I know you know. Um, and these are people that come from the music world that have connected with several several people from the industry and from the artist side. And I think having these type of people um, within within your own platform not only allows for more dialogue to, to kind of occur, but it also gives you an opportunity to kind of understand what are their needs and really empathize and kind of deliver based off of the needs of the community and not just what we think we know. Um, and I think that is an issue that's kind of been more prominent as of lately is a lot of people come in thinking that they know what type of products people need and come in presenting solutions immediately rather than thinking about what is the immediate problem. So uh, we've been very fortunate to kind of be blessed with a great product. But I think on top of that, having people who came from the community that can open up these dialogues and have these conversations and effectively create ambassadors out of it, I think was a big win for us. Um, and so I would say that was probably the main striking point is like the community being able to connect with members of the community. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about viewers, I'm talking about everyone, you know, all of us in this panel included. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think um, certainly from, from my experience, it was like, <clears throat> one that opened the mindedness of the audience so you can put we we could put on whatever music and everyone was coming on being you know super friendly and like you just didn't have that on the other uh, you know the facebook's and you from whenever we've been streaming before and then we came on and then you know everyone's kind of friends they know each other know each other's music tastes. it's just like this isn't the proper community uh and that was you know, it's so nice that actually now we get our artists to come in so Yesterday, we had like Seth Troxler and Ron Trent and all these people in our chat room chatting to our community. And um, last week, we had, last month, we had Kerry Chandler and stuff. They were all in there talking to their fans in there. And that, I don't think that's happened really before. Um, and certainly the way Twitch has set it up and, and the functionality it has, it makes it very simple for that to happen. I think, you know, that's, that's, that was probably the biggest selling, selling point for us as a, as a platform. Mm hmm. Yeah. And just to add to that, I got involved with Twitch, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago when they started diversifying beyond gaming. And, and I think the thing to remember, you know, and I come from, you know, entertainment and kind of the geek space and, you know, wearing your, your geek and nerd flags very proudly. And the way that we define, you know, being a geek or a nerd is just loving something, whatever it is. And Twitch has sort of mastered that in the form of community. So maybe it was gaming lovers to begin with. And then when I got involved through, you know, a past company of mine, it was more like Dungeons and Dragons and different kind of entertainment. And now it's, you know, music and all of these things, what they have in common is just communities that love that thing. And um, Twitch is the platform to find your community, really. And now there's a big growing music community. So, yeah, the hat's off to, to you guys. And you know, it's really incredible. Thank you. And I will say, like, final, final points. Like, there is, you know, a, a, a lot of, uh, I, I came from previous tech, tech, tech background. And a lot of the companies I work that the biggest focus that they've always had is the first time user experience. Like you make an account, Katie, and you know, you hop on and you watch the live stream for the first time. Like, what does that experience look like? And I think that we've uh, meticulously like focused on what that experience looks like and how we can make it the best possible experience. And I think the best part is that we don't have to tell streamers how to, to kind of conduct themselves. I think a lot of people already know how to respond. And when you go into a chat room for the first time and you type a message, being brand new and you have someone respond back to you, there's a certain type of magic that happens that just gets you like really excited. And I feel like it activates something in your brain and it just gets you hooked into it um, to the point where like, you know, you end up being there for hours at a time and you're like, shit, where did the time go? Um, and, and I think there's a certain little magic that kind of happens with that. Uh, and that only happens uh, when, when, when you're on, when you're on Twitch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys for breaking that down. Um, and it, you mentioned this sort of moment in May, June, July, that, you know, this thing was really sailing and there were so many events and, you know, I was writing about so many events and there were way more than that that were happening. And it seems to have tapered down a bit since then. Do you think that people, artists specifically, are a bit burned out or do you think people are being more selective? I don't know if it has tapered down. We're still really doing an insane amount um 
So I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, like, you know, it probably works in the same way as the kind of summer festival season, right? It's just like winter is a kind of quieter time. Um, people get back to making music and, you know, the, the, if you look at the sort of festival calendar, there are many festivals at this time of year. There's maybe BPM and, you know, not many others. I think, you know, most people are probably planning um, sort of April onwards. I know that, you know, we're working on a huge thing with... Um, for Sherry at Sanzar for LWE, which is, you know, starting in April, um, this tobacco dock space that, that, that uh, they've built, which is incredible. And th that's when they're starting. And I think most of the kind of festivals and people that we're talking about, you know, it'll be April and then it will start really ramping up through, through the summer again. Um, but I think in terms of individual artists and labels and things like that, we're still seeing a huge amount of, 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 of content. Totally. I would just echo that. We haven't seen any kind of slowdown. And, and in fact, people are realizing consumer behaviors changed and that now they're planning for parallel events, both both live streaming, virtual and, and IRL. So, yeah, I think it might be a seasonal thing for Ed's point, um, but the, the, it's, it's still an explosion of, of demand. Totally. I think, I think uh, you know, the bigger names like the Diplos that people were used to seeing in the beginning of, of, of quarantine, um, you know, they may have tapered down in terms of their appearance on live streams, but uh, to, to both and Sherry's point, uh, in terms of numbers, it's only gone up. Um, and so there may be particular artists that may have tapered down or been more selective about, you know, how much visibility they want to give to themselves. And I think a lot of that came down to you know, foresight of like how long this pandemic was going to be. And I think, uh, you know, from our standpoint, a lot of the partnerships that we're forming now are more focused on increasing that level of visibility. And so both from a number standpoint and from an appearance, like, yes, you may not see Diplo as often, or you may not see Cascade as often on Twitch, but you will see, you know, several other talented DJs that are of the same caliber um, that, that, will, that, will be, that will be live and appearing and, and performing. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying there. Um, I'm curious, do you feel that there's a sector of the fan base that's simply not interested in sort of participating in this way? Like they don't want to hang out by their computer. Um, and so I, I guess the question is like, has the electronic scene sort of lost fans or seen fans uh, taper off during this moment? No, I don't think so. I think, um... There's a different level of 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 fan who you know might sit and on a, in a chat room and, and really sort of engage with it all, and then there's other people that might you know dip in and out. But I don't think um, I don't think it's kind of hurt, and I think it's probably only kind of made more fans out of out of electronic music. I think you know the other thing about it is that certainly during the pandemic you have people that can go to clubs whenever, right? So it's just like, you know, I don't need to watch a live stream because um, I can go to Bergheim or I can go to Watergate, wherever I am, I can I can start going out, so I don't need to. But then when the, planet hit, the pandemic hit, nobody could go out. So you've got all these people that are like, normally may not watch a live stream because they can actually just go out. And now they're like, well, I can't go out, so I'm gonna actually sit and watch streams. So I think there's more people that have probably engaged with and watch live streams now than there has ever has been. And that's fans and, and non-fans. I totally agree with that. I, I don't have much to add. Like, I, I, I haven't seen any sort of loss, even loss of interest. It's really just getting more and more people. We haven't talked much about mobile. I mean, there's so much to talk about, but like you can be on the go and watch these things. You could be anywhere and watch these things. And, um, you know, consumer behavior is, is all on our little little guys right here, right? Like, you know, it's, and, and that is um, only kind of doubling down and live streaming is so easily available on that, that you could be anywhere. You could be walking down the street, you could be commuting on a subway and, um, and it's accessible. Sure. Yeah, just echoing uh, again, both Ed, Ed and Sherry, I think that there had, Definitely, def definitely uh, has been some people that are resistant to um, to change, and I think are, are are not into the idea of live streaming themselves. But uh, in whole, I, I think that this has only increased the visibility, and I think even culturally, you know, as a as a fan, 
you know, you go to a music festival and you, you watch a set and you're like, Oh my God, that set for um, cascade was so amazing. Like I need to watch it again. And you know, you'll find clips on YouTube or wherever the heck on Instagram and you'll replay it back those memories. And sometimes people when record on the phones, they'll just replay it back because of how magical that was. And now you can take that same experience and kind of replicate it on a live stream. So I think it's only continued to increase the fan base um, and it has only continued to increase the, the visibility. So uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, the video on demand thing is something we haven't discussed, but that's a great point. You know, it, it becomes even more accessible. Um, and then when you talk about moving forward and thinking about the metaverse and recreating, like Ed mentioned, tobacco docs, like when you recreate actual, um, you know, in 3D actual either clubs or worlds or whatever it is, entire festivals, um, it becomes another level of experience. Um, that might get some of those people who maybe didn't just want to watch some recording, but they, oh, I can actually meet people and talk to people as a person or as an avatar and I'm immersed. I think that's, you know, the next level um, there and that that's coming. Cool. Cool. We are running low on time. I have one more question. Obviously, at some point, things are going to open back up. How does live streaming persist after that happens? What's its place and sort of how many new fans do you project being in the live space that have come in through live streaming? I think a lot, I think a lot. I think, um, and I think the two will coexist. I mean, people were streaming festivals and clubs, you know, for years anyway. Um, but I think uh, in terms of festivals, you know, this is going to have to be a part of every festival's promotional strategy, uh, and it will, and it should also be a part of, uh, you know, their brand strategy. So, you know, you can have an activation on site here, but really, what you need to do is amplify it on online as well. And the best way to do that is through through streaming. And I think, um, and then you know, all the kind of different kind of variations of what you can do in stream and in game with with the with your brands. Um, so I think you know this is probably just the beginning, and it, and it will and it will um, it will explode from here. Cool. Yeah, I mean, Ed, Ed nailed it. But that that it's it's just exploding. It's it's just the beginning. People do um, pretty quickly again. People do understand the ramifications and the ability to add on top of live events. Like we'll never replace an amazing show in person. Never, ever, ever. But if you can't make it or, you know, you're unable to or, or otherwise can't for whatever reason, you have options. And I think that's the way to look at it going forward, that options are the key and that there's going to be so many and, and so many companies will arise and so many new talent um, will come to the limelight. And um, it's an exciting time. I think initially there's going to be some patenting that will happen as we return back to in real life, back to the open world. Um, but very quickly, uh, we will see a lot of people return back to, to the live streaming as well. I think that it's going to be ingrained into everyone's promotional strategy, as Ed mentioned, but I also think that it's just ingrained into culturally just how we consume content. You know, it's not, this is not something that's going to go away. This is something that's going to be ingrained in everyone's strategy uh, uh, on a week to week, month to month. And we're already talking to several artists about, you know, as they go into their 2022 strategy for, 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 for their concert series uh, and they go on tour, like talking about promoting their first, their first concert, uh, whatever first show that they're doing and having that be live streamed on Twitch. So um, certainly don't think that uh, this is going to go away. And, you know, there's already been a few trailblazers that have also, kind of paved the way even prior to the pandemic that did, you know, if you have a two week festival week, one was already being live streamed. So um, the, 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 the foundations are already there. It's just our time not to fill it in. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. This is really fascinating and comprehensive and I appreciate you all joining me. Thank you very much. Katie. Thank Thank you guys so much. Thank you. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.